Hello there, prospective client. I am Pruitt, this is Jim Davis, and boy, do we have a pitch for you. You and a couple of friends wanna to get together and adventure in maybe an unconventional settlement. What if the blanket is a fort, or the town has a floor of hot lava? We have a timeshare for you if you can share some time with us today on WebDM. All right, Jim. So we're, we're talking about unconventional settlements today. For the DM, what's the most important part here to, to think about as far as your unconventionality? What's more important to you, the settlement or like the environment? I mean, because there's some distinction there's to be some made, distinction. Right? Is it an unusual settlement because it's in an unusual environment or is it just an unusual settlement in an otherwise mundane environment? I think for me, the reason why it's unusual is because we want to showcase something fantastic. Right. And we want to bring in the fantastical erase the mundane and, and make this really lean into the fantasy of the of the setting when you're thinking of a settlement that embraces the fantastical that embraces the the fantasy nature of the game I think it is worth thinking like is the environment the part that makes this unusual mm -hmm. or is this the environments otherwise mundane and it's something about the inhabitants the, the you know the the way the city is arranged or or something about the city itself that makes it unusual part of why i like you know we want to talk about these is is just because they're a great way to showcase those parts of your setting right. that make it unique and different and and lean into that fantasy yeah. element yeah it's not just another not just another fucking fantasy town sitting on the edge of a forest in a nice glen with an inn and a whatever and, right. you know i mean you you want to see something different for players who've been around for a while uh, and and the, the sort of newness of just playing the game and, and relying on some of the classic tropes of like the dusty border settlement mm -hmm. that, that's on the edges of civilization, a, a chaotic sort of wilderness beyond in which they can adventure is one way of that. Mm -hmm. There's also the big city, which tends to have a lot of very modern things in it. Mm -hmm. I understand why it's very convenient. Not everyone who's a you know a dungeon master you know is familiar with sort of medieval cities or early modern cities or, or something like that. So there's a lot of like modernisms that kind of creep up into it. And and I find that injecting the fantastical is a good corrective to that because otherwise we, we tend to create things that we're familiar with and that we know. And because we're familiar with the mundane world and its mundane workings and its banality, mm -hmm. <laughs> then our fantasy locations can sort of take on that tinge and it's just like oh you mean this is just another town with regular buildings where they do commerce and are taxed and any number of places are like this you do, are you do you why would you even name this don't even you know you don't even need to name this fucking blank yeah. milk toast town yeah. right like just stop it <laughs> and so trying to escape into fantasy here <laughs> right. my, i don't want to think about taxes a settlement or mm -hmm. a place where, uh, you know, a, a site for adventure. And this is different than like a fantastical dungeon or a fantastical adventuring site. These are places that are home bases for the party, places right. where they interact with NPCs. There can be adventures there, mm -hmm. but it's more multi-use than, uh, you know, in other adventure locations. Okay, so what's the first uh, aspect of that settlement that you want to focus on then? What, what, what do you think about first? I think of something unusual about the, the world at large that this settlement can embody. I think up an idea for it, right? This is a, we'll, we'll get to some of these sort of later in the episode, but something like, okay, a sphinx is a judge. That, and that might be it. This is a city in which the, a sphinx is the justice system. And I'm gonna let that sit. And then I come back and I'm gonna give it another pass. A sphinx is a judge, but what else? And as you come back to your ideas, I, at least three passes, and they need time to sort of sit and mature and let the idea sort of percolate, and you wouldn't want to do these all in, say, one sitting. But you keep coming back to it, and each time you're like, all right, well, so the Sphinx is the system of uh, system of law. What does that mean? How do people you know, interact with that? What is the ramifications of that for the setting? And each time we want to add on a layer of the fantastic until you get the final product, which is this thought out, realized, fantastical element that you're gonna place in your settlement along with other things that will lend it a mem that will make it memorable right. and give the party something to interact with. And, and also at the same time, show your players the fantasy of your world, not tell them about it. So that's kind of where I start. I, I think we can 
break down the the elements of a fantastical settlement uh, into some sort of broad categories, though. Those would be the inhabitants and or customs right. that make the settlement unusual. The architecture of the city itself. What are the buildings made out of? What are what are the how how does that interact with day to day life of the inhabitants? And then the environment itself. Right? Mm -hmm. Is it uh, there's something unusual about it because it's underwater or in a planar location or something like that that makes it different from just like here's a city by the sea and you know it's mm -hmm. ruled by something weird and fantastical but it's otherwise a city by the sea it's, it's a port town you know. right those are like the broad categories that i start thinking in okay okay so let's start with your inhabitants and customs mm -hmm. uh what for you what's uh, off the top of your head what's a fun uh, inhabitant and or custom i mean to me i think inhabitants it, it's not just like a big city full of cosmopolitan elves and dwarves and humans and halflings and orcs and all the, the business and they kind of get along and that's one way of doing it the water deep model right uh, but even water deep has fantastical elements with like the masked lords of water deep so that their identities are concealed and and the sort of the under mountain that's yeah. present there so even water deep has a, a good healthy dose of the the fantastical there what is it about the inhabitants that live there if if it's a weird environment how have they adapted to that environment mm -hmm. if the environment's otherwise mundane then what's our first sort of pass with what makes the inhabitants fantastical? Mm -hmm. So maybe there's something about who they are or how they interact. Maybe it's a, a type of social custom that they have that's weird and different. Uh, that you do a couple of passes on until you've got something that's satisfying. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's something about the nature of the inhabitants themselves that's fantastical. So, for instance, a city of the undead is one of those things where this could be a normal city, regular buildings, streets, whatever, the physics are the, the same, but for some reason it's inhabited by the dead. Maybe it's on a plane or, or something where the dead don't die when they perish, they come back in some form or fashion. Um, I've, I've got one in Land Between Two Rivers where a demon has cursed the inhabitants of a city to not die. Visitors to the city, no problem. Come and go however you like. If you were there when the demon arrived, you are cursed. And the inhabitants have tried all manner of ways to attempt to kill themselves. Mm -hmm. And when the party gets there, they're all fucking beetle juiced out with like holding their heads in their hands yeah. and like cut in half and strangled and like all the ways in which they've tried to kill each other or done whatever bizarre things that you would do if you were trapped for eternity without being able to die but your body doesn't heal. You know, all the different things you might try to do. They've sewn body parts back on. Maybe they got bored and sewed different parts to each other. They just lost to, that arm that one time and had to get another arm. Had to get arm. another arm. Yeah, <laughs> so like the party hasn't gotten there. They may never get there. It's just a city out in the wasteland. But it is a place. And, and going there means the party would have to navigate some weird social norms, right? How are they allowed to interact with mm -hmm. the inhabitants of the place? Uh, is there some kind of situation where the inhabitants think that the party might be able to help them? In which case, they might be forceful about that. And, and like, uh, what was it? What's the episode in Firefly where they kidnap the doctor? You know, like oh, something like that. Yes. Where they <laughs> uh, believe the episode is called Safe. Right. Um, yeah. uh, they do something like that, where where you know maybe there's an exorcist in the party, a cleric or, or a necromancer of some kind that the inhabitants of the uh, of the city think that they can you know, use in some way. So that's that's like one example. I, you know, the mm -hmm. World of Warcraft has one as well. Uh, the, the, the city there where the, the, the Forsaken are, where it's like this is where they live and where they dwell. It's sort of like mm -hmm. in the under city of their old capital kind of thing. Because on, uh, on Neros 4 in Starward Bound, uh, there's a gnomish city. It was a former logging city, but the whole forest was logged, just completely deforested. Mm -hmm. And it left all these holes in the ground that spiders moved in. And most people were just like, oh crap, and just kind of wrote it off because there's giant spiders everywhere. And then the gnomes moved in were like, that's a lot of silk. Let's get in there. Let's let's get them calm. Let's harvest that silk. Yeah. And we can make a trade out of this. And then it became like a big, like, you know, they create their own, you know, textile industry mm -hmm, mm -hmm. at Forester's Hollow. Adapting to the monstrous ecology that's yeah. around them, making it work for them. Yeah. That, that's another thing, right? Like, like, is it a city in which some of the monsters from the D&D universe or any other fantasy RPG universe are present mm -hmm. and sort of work their way into the 
setting of the of the city. For me, like the city of mages, Oracala Palantine is one of those where I did a lot of revisions on it, and and it's had many iterations over the years. So it's like there's the times that I played it in home games, and then the season of Saber Dice that we did, and then even after that that I've used it. Every time it gets a little different. The initial like burst of ideas for me was just it's a city that instead of politicians and and the traditional structures of power, it's all mages. It's mages, mages, mages. And then it, it sort of becomes like, well, people get things done through patronage networks and mm -hmm. mages t help take care of parts of the city because it's sort of prestigious for them. But that kind of creates a city environment in which there's no structures in place. There's no system of law. There's no system of justice. There's no formal systems of anything. It's just a bunch of mages that live in a location who have agreed that it's beneficial to live in this location, so we're gonna make this work. Working through all of the various customs of that. Don't harm stray animals, because it might be a familiar or a shape-shifted individual. Um, you know, <laughs> leave, leave places for flying creatures to perch and move about uh, and things like that. Like, all of those kind of uh, customs came about because I'm like, this is the way the city works. How would the people that live there adapt to that, and what would they hold uh, mm -hmm. to be important? What kind of rituals would they find important? I would go back to Starbound, another uh, on the on the back of Rontame, the the big celestial manta ray mm -hmm. thing. Like they have to, that's mostly mages. Mm -hmm. uh, they've ha they've had to figure out how to live on the back of this giant beast in kind of a symbiotic relationship, but mm -hmm. it's all about recycling and mm -hmm. and not having too much excess. Right. Uh, things like that. As a segue into the second uh, thing to think about architecture, there they have to like do a lot of extra dimensional spaces because they need to limit weight right, on the back right, right. of this thing yeah. because they have a lot of people that want to come there and they're like, oh, this is a three story building, but it's actually a 10 story building. Right, right, you can right. only see three stories of it. Yeah. And that's yeah. a big thing that's worked into the architecture of the place. And so it's more, it is a tenable situation. Right? And obviously, the interaction between these things, like how the inhabitants set up customs, is going to influence the architecture of it. Of course, the environment that a person lives in or that the city exists in will influence mm -hmm. the environment and vice versa. The, in, the architecture of a city will help determine some of the customs of it. There's a lot about that though, just the inhabitants themselves, there's so many different ways you can play it, whether it's like an odd underclass of people, like say Dragon Age or The Witcher where elves and, and other uh, sort of non-human races are, are seen as second class citizens and kind of like kept oppressed and in ghettos and, and mistreated. Uh, you can have something like that or it can be like odd systems that are in place, like the like mentioning like the Sphinx. In Oracala Palantine, the, the neighborhood of the Street of Spells, the Sphinx shows up periodically and anyone who who brings a dispute in front of the Sphinx will have it judged by a being of perfect wisdom and magic and, and, and all of these things that, that it can do. It's gonna be better than any mortal court that could be uh, you know, brought forth, but justice is at the end of its clawed paw. Bringing a, a dispute before the Sphinx carries with it a risk because if it determines that it was a frivolous dispute, then it might not look favorably on you for bringing it again. And so that modifies the behavior of the people that are there. They try to work things out on their own, as opposed to sort of bringing them before the Sphinx. Moving into that architecture and, and away from the, uh, away from sort of like the inhabitants of a place, the way a, a city is laid out, it, it has a big impact on mm -hmm. the way that the, the people move about the city, the way that the city is arranged and, and, and how people live there. If your city is a fortress, if it's meant as a military base, if, it, if it's primarily there for military reasons, then there might be non-military personnel there or people that live there, citizens, but they've got to make do with the fact that they're non-combatants in a mm -hmm. military location. That's an example of, of, of using architecture as a way to shape your settlement. What's the purpose of the settlement? Why would the people that are there construct the buildings and structures and the like that, that they have? Is there something about the way the city is arranged that's somehow important? Oracle Palantine is arranged the way it is because it is a nexus of global ley lines. There's a, a web work of, of magical streams, basically, and they meet in this one place. It's kind of a swampy place. No one would otherwise build a city there, but because it's magically significant, everything about the city is designed to channel that magical energy towards one location. 
And so buildings are arranged so as not to disrupt the flow of magic. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, some of them are built to channel it. And there's a lot of like sacred geometry and magical architecture that's built into the city. I see it as, as a lot like, say, Imperial Rome with its aqueducts and, and great big uh, monolithic structures. Mm -hmm. Except instead of this case, it's all are arcane and meant to channel magic. And then the people that live there just happen to live there. Uh, they just are there, and, and the, they just you know make do <laughs> with uh, with that fact. <laughs> One thing, uh, as far as architecture goes, that I, I immediately think of the hanging temples, the air temple in Avatar. Right. Yes. Like on the underside of a cliff, because there's uh -huh. a species or a peoples that can like fly and whatever. So yeah. if you have uh, more fantastical creatures, like a city of like uh, Arakakura mm -hmm. or something mm -hmm. like that, mm -hmm. yeah, you might have like on the other side of a cliff. Their city hangs and they, they catch the updrafts from, from below, oh, yeah. the valleys below and yeah. things like that. And that, that's like the same with the interaction between in, uh, uh, architecture, inhabitants and environments. These are not distinct cut and dried categories. They bleed over and influence mm -hmm. each other, right? You know, a flying city is going to perhaps have some of the same characteristics of that hanging city that you're talking about in which we're talking like say a city in the, the, the realm of air or something like that. Or you've got a world in which flight is very common or something. What does that look like for the people that are on that city? Does it ever touch the ground? What mm -hmm. do they do? With, what do the people that live there do for their needs? Like thinking just through the needs of the city. How do they get food? What do they do with their waste? How do they live? What do they do? What's the point of the settlement? How often do people just fall? How often do people just fall, right? <laughs> you know, is are there other flying cities that, that the communication exists between? All, thinking through all of that and making sure that it, it, there's nothing wrong with just like coming up with something off the top of your head and going like, this is in my campaign world. But once you've done that, thinking through the ramifications of it, thinking how the this location fits into it is gonna be really important. And the architecture of a place, the materials that someone uses to construct it. Is this an elven tree city that's been grown over centuries through mm -hmm. careful cultivation and subtle magics to create a living tower tree that they all sort of live in, mm -hmm. um, but that is capable of providing life for this settlement here. The Magate Acadium, the Mages College that's on the back of, of the beast Rontame, uh -huh. one thing I wanted to do with that was the interaction between it and the other beast. There's another, a phoenix. Uh -huh. So they can take the, the, the feathers and take the barbs and the, 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 the veins of the feather, mm -hmm. break it down and make building material out of that. And it's gonna be very light because right. it's from a bird. It's from so a bird. it's lighter. Sure. And then so when you couple using that for your building materials at the college and the town surrounding, and you're using extra dimensional spaces to hide a lot of the weight, the entirety of the town weighs about 25,000 pounds, <laughs> which is like, <laughs> thinking about that like is nothing. Right. It's nothing it's on nothing. the back of this beast, but yeah. it would need to be so that they could be on the back of this beast and not, not burden it. Right, you know, right, and, right. And actually be like a viable uh, part of its personal like biological like ecosystem. I don't know, I, I really enjoy thinking about that because it is it is well, balls ass nuts. <laughs> it, it's, it's just nuts, it, it adds color to your descriptions of it, yeah. but it's like, what if there's something about the construction materials of the places that you're, that you're envisioning uh -huh. that's magical or significant in some way? Yeah. Uh, living stone or, or coral or something like that, right? Where mm -hmm. it's a grown kind of, see, I'm thinking like Wraithbone from 40K, the oh, Eldar there, this yeah. sort of like material that they, shape and grow and is living and yeah. psychically resonant and, uh -huh. and like um, like what if your buildings are, are, are made out of mm -hmm. that? What if the structures are made out of it? So Or the uh, the Preterite Vong from uh, that one Star Wars novel that everybody oh, yeah, hates, yeah. Ferrari <laughs> Chewy Killer. <laughs> Those people grow they grow their ships out of living coral and yeah. all their all their technology and everything is living in some form or fashion. Right, right, right. And they, they grow all of their things. It's another axis of thought. Mm -hmm. and, and another way, if, if you're over here with your inhabitants and you're like, oh, I just, I'm, I'm not really feeling it, I, I can't think of something interesting, then consider the architecture and layout of a city and seeing if that is not a way to make something fantastic and out of the ordinary and then come back to something else. The same way with like maybe starting with environments is appropriate for you because you want to like, where is this city and settlement like situated in the first place? Will mm -hmm. that tell me more about what's going on? Um, I mean... I think like some of the easy ones are like cities that are underwater or something like that, right? Like yeah. How do, how, how do they breathe? How do they, for me, how do they keep people out? 
<laughs> right. Right. <laughs> uh, or keep unwanted creatures or something else out. And so when I think about like underwater cities, there's of course like the classic glass dome, mm -hmm. sort of like once you're in there, you're in an otherwise airy environment, but the ocean or the water is just like right beyond. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe it's one where that barrier is permeable. So water gets in and out and people who are invited in can come in and out, but otherwise keeps out everything else. Um, so you're talking about the Gungan City right now. The Gungan it's, City, of course, is one <laughs> from, from uh, Phantom Menace. Is, is a, it's your uh, description, Jim Davis. Yeah, well, I mean, that's what it is. It, it, it is, and in terms of like a fantastic location, yeah. the Gungan City is not bad. Yeah. Um, you know, it's full of Gungans and part <laughs> I mean, of Phantom Menace, but <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> you take what you get. Right? For inspiration, <laughs> though. <laughs> but it, as a source of inspiration, it, it is there. And I think it's one of those things where when I start thinking of underwater cities and I start thinking of like ways to make them even more fantastical, I start thinking of something like, what if sort of like a city that exists on the inside of gigantic bubbles mm -hmm. that float up into some sort of place, burst, the whatever was in that bubble gently falls back down to whatever the liquid is, and then more bubbles come up. So then the point of the city, it's more about your relationship with the people around you and where you are when a bubble is formed. So like in a market, you want everybody together and a giant bubble sort of forms and slowly floats up. People have to do all their activity before it's going to burst. It bursts, then they disperse, go to others. Maybe there's like a lot of little tiny bubbles then. And then they go back home. They can go back home. Maybe the bubbles collide and merge, but it's constantly in motion and constantly churning, bubbling up, falling, bubbling up, falling. Mm -hmm. And it's it's more of a, a city as a gathering of people mm -hmm. and a gathering of beings than a permanent location with structures. It's something even more fantastical. So imagine placing something like this as like, okay, you've got to go, the party has to go find someone here, navigate this thing. Well, first off, they got to get around whatever the liquid is. They've got to get, make sure they're in close enough proximity that when a bubble forms, they're in there. If they don't, is there a way to get out of a bubble without popping it prematurely? Is there a way to move between bubbles? It's an intriguing look at, at having a, like kind of a dynamic city, but it's all just, it's an internal dynamism, right? Right. You know, one day you're living on the Upper East Side and the next day you're down South Side. I, I'm thinking of like those river, sort of like river trading that you sometimes see in like travel documentaries where it's like thousands of small boats clogging a river and it's like you could walk across them to the other bank. And it's in motion and moving and it's temporary and not, you know, it's, 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 a, it's an ephemeral type mm -hmm. uh, gathering of people and then to me in my mind we just take it one step further like what's the most ephemeral one of the most ephemeral things i can think of like bubbles you know they're just sort of there for a second or two and then gone mm -hmm. um and underwater is one under underground is another obviously thinking about your underground cities the first thing that comes up for me is like what do they eat this is a sterile alien environment of rock and nothing, rock and space. Mm -hmm. You know, there's there's no light, there's no whatever. There's there is food available, um, but getting a lot of people together in one location presents a logistical challenge, right? I'm real fond of the OSR product, Veins of the Earth, and they, they tr that is a product that attempts to answer this question. Cultures and civilizations that lived in an underground environment that resembles more our own subterranean environment than the fantastical underdark of, say, Greyhawk or Forgotten Realms. What if they were cave systems like as we know them? lifeless for the most part not always though right caves can't are living environment but different and having say 10,000 people in a cavern is gonna be like well what the how the fuck do they eat a lot of creepy crawlies and and mushrooms creepy are... crawlies and mushrooms and you can imagine when things get bad the underclass gets eaten they you know it, it just will and and maybe a sense of scale if it's a subterranean environment and maybe a city is like 200 people Mm -hmm. Because that's the max that any number of eating, you know, beings who need to eat can kind of get together in a place. Those are sort of like more conventional, obvious, underwater, underground uh, environments. Your Toho sphere with its massive creatures mm -hmm. is another one of these sort of things where like each one of them has its own individual settlement on the backs of it, right? Or most of them do. Well, yeah. most of them do. The manta ray that has the wizard's college. Uh -huh. And then there's a giant turtle, which its shell is 
gone and is actually concave and has an ocean in it and just you can imagine very uh, like the water tribe in Avatar is how I kind of see it. There's yeah. there's like four tribes there and it's all like fast moving boats, you know, like Inuit, Eskimo peoples of the north. Uh, uh -huh, they uh -huh. ride in their fast boats and they go do fishing and things like that. Bone scrimshaw, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. the, very, you know, very living off the land kind of thing. There's um, uh, a fire serpent, which, but that's more like corporate, like you have to want to live there. You have to build a place. Yeah. And so there are a few uh, basically corporate entities that have built their offices there. So anybody that works there has to live there also, but it's all very kind of nefarious. It's where Dr. Evil would live and work <laughs> and have his domain. But there's, it's basically like, there's like five Bond villains that live on the back right, of this one. Right, right, right. Um, fire serpent, yeah. And then and the last one that really is inhabited is the uh, the phoenix, mm -hmm. Foxes, but it's like a conclave of like monks slash prisoners where that is the justice system mm -hmm. in this sphere is that if you F up, nobody has jails or anything. They right. just send you over to this phoenix and help you know, preen it and, and take right. care of its feathers. And if it has like a, a mite infestation, you gotta, gotta go take care right. of that and that kind of thing. Right, but they're the size of like bulldogs. Yeah, but <laughs> for the most part, it's like the Night's Watch. You get right. sent over here and there's people that wanna go and genuinely, genuinely help because you are, you're caring for this beast. You are literally caring for something that is larger than yourself, right. but isn't like a god yeah. or anything, you know? I really like, looked at it from a host parasite symbiotic relationship like how can you do this where it would allow you to live on its back right because you do things for it you, know? you do things for it on, here, like on right. rontame like it's a wizard's college but i like i wanted this very weird uh awkward like social d distinction in like there's all these wizards studying it and everything but there's also a class of people and I just call them spongers. Mm -hmm. And they go out and they gather lichen off the back that builds up around like its pores. Mm -hmm. And its pores secrete like oil to help it make its skin smooth so it can glide through space. Mm -hmm. So they gather this up and make sponges out of it and spread that out. And then they use that for <laughs> other things, for building materials and, and yeah. whatever. But like, so there's this worker class mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. is just there and that's what they do. And, 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 and then, you know, they live a good life for the most part, but it's like, do you want to do that for the rest of your life? Yeah, yeah. Um, I see that. It, it, so like they're, the people that have adapted to life on a big monster mm -hmm. uh, are one. A long time ago, I sort of read this uh, thread on some message forum where it's like using the Tarasque. Mm -hmm. as a source for sort of like a, a fantasy city in which oh yeah which is like the Tarrasque is submerged the city sort of built on top of it there's a, a great big mine or something where they go and harvest parts of the Tarrasque because it's going to regenerate its bones and its muscle and whatever there's a whole priesthood dedicated to like making sure the Tarrasque is kept asleep and and slumbering and then it's like this entire mortal empire is centered on the fact that there's a city built around a Tarrasque, they are using the, the resources of it, they're making weapons out of its bones and using its blood and other fluids to create powerful magics and then they're feeding their armies and citizens a never-ending supply of high-protein Tarrasque meat, which is, you know, that meat frees up all of the people who would otherwise have to be farming or producing yeah. food from to do other things and yeah. and now they, you know, sort of like march, they're, they're on a, a conquest because they have this fantastical resource in a city that's built around keeping this Tarrasque asleep mm -hmm. while also carving pieces off of it. Unless you have a really good plan, never try to lay siege to that city. Never like you, yeah, right. the, you. You're just not gonna run out of food. Yeah. You're not gonna run out, you're not gonna run out of anything. You're not gonna run out of anything, no. It was weird and sort of thinking through mm -hmm. the implications of it. I, I like sort of like incorporating big monsters into the city. Is there a place for uh, larger monsters within your settlement. Maybe it's atiogs and oozes that serve as a sewer system or, or, mm -hmm. or you know, garbage disposal, basically. It's, yep. it's fantastical monsters that are capable of reading minds and making judgments that serve as rulers and judges and the like mm -hmm. in the city. Or, or maybe it's, they, they are the rulers themselves. You know, it's, it, there's a dragon or some other fantastical creature that rules here because it's better at it. Than, yeah. than others. The example cities that you can find in like baseline D&D lore, uh, it, it, it's big stuff like Sigil, which I'm sorry guys, internet, I'm a Sigil guy. Just am, not I understand. A, not a Sigil? I'm not a Sigil guy, I, I don't hate. It's, if that's the way somebody wants to go with it, that's fine. But, I mean, people uh, are allowed to be wrong if they want. Team Sigil. Right. Sure. It's sort of like on the inside of a donut. It's If you dig into it, it's infinite, but it also has boundaries. It sits at the mm -hmm. top of an infinite spire that you can't ever reach, but you can see. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like this weird 
kind of place, this city of doors where you can get portals to everywhere. That's that sigil, but there's also city of brass, mm -hmm. right, in the, in the, the plane of fire where the Afrit sort of maintain their control and, and, and have a city. And that means that there's commerce and trade and, and gathering and people want something and, and there's NPCs to get involved with and it might be inhospitable. You might have to find some way to gain immunity to fire and, and be able to live there. But it's a settlement that you could go to and trade and find information and meet people and, and all these kinds of things. There's so many others. They're, they're mentioned on some of them in the DMG. There's places like Equa and the Great Dismal Delve slash City of Jewels. Mm -hmm. uh, Equa's the, the city of the Wind Dukes on the Plane of Air, and the City of Jewels is like the, the great uh, slave city of the Earth genies kind of thing, the Tao. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I was just thinking of, of, of fun uh, environments for, for to place your city, uh, mm -hmm. mostly because I've been watching a lot of Thor Ragnarok since it went up on Netflix. Uh, but Sakaar, yeah, like that's a that's a great place. Like especially in D and D, like you like you have with uh, kind of land between two rivers, mm -hmm. you just have portals everywhere, portals everywhere and everywhere. just pouring just shit in. And it's just it's in. the place where everything shits on. Right. But that means you got a lot of stuff. Everywhere. There's just a lot of stuff floating around, and and the like, planar cities are really good for that because they can be number one, they can be really easy to reach, mm -hmm. and they can like sigils like a doorway away, right? You right. could I know the key yep. to get through this door, and now yep. I'm in a whole other city. You, you just got done uh, almost getting caught cheating on a married woman the uh, the night after her mar her wedding, uh -huh. and you were pulling your pants on and fell backwards out the window. Out the window. And guess what? That's how you get to this very specific. It's a very key. specific portal key, but you went out the right one. <laughs> right one. Uh, at the at this one bridal very suite. Exact, very exact moment. <laughs> um, it's like all of these places, whether we're talking like the gate towns in Outland that, uh -huh. that lead to their respective planes uh, on the Great Wheel, or like a city built on a dead god in the Astral Sea, these are the kinds of fantastical cities that I, they're, they highlight what's unique and fun about Dungeons and Dragons. Game of Thrones is fine. I like Game of Thrones, I like Westeros. It, it, it's, a, it's a great place to, to, to play in and, and to look at and, and, and really, if you're looking for that like level of, of gritty blood and guts fantasy, it's fun. Right. But it's also kind of like King's Landing is the same as just about any other big medieval-ish sort of city. There's yep. a fire guild there. There, there are place. It was once very fantastical, home to dragons and mm -hmm. fire al uh, alchemists and the like, uh, mm -hmm. pyromancers. But it's otherwise just a city. It's got a big keep. It's got a big temple, or it did for a while. Uh, and it's got a, a, a it's got a shit place, right? You know, a, a shitty right. a street. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It's got all the places, and and there's a lot of fantasy cities that are, are interchangeable with King's Landing. You know, use whichever version you like. Uh, you know, our show on urban adventures is sort of a, a good companion, I guess, to this video, and that we give some ideas for for fantasy cities, but. To me, Dungeons and Dragons is about more than just taking something that existed in the real world, filing the serial numbers off, and slapping an orc on it. It's about really thinking through how these places work, what makes them fantastical, and mm -hmm. how those fantastical elements interact with the day-to-day -day lives of the people that live there. Thinking through that and then putting that well-thought-out sort of place in your, in your campaign where the players can then visit meet people, get the things they need, cook up different adventures, find a place to call home base. Uh, they can be a centerpiece for a campaign and really highlight what's unique and interesting about your fantasy world as opposed to just like, you know, going the easy route and just throwing in yet another thatched roofed, narrow streeted medieval city. Unconventional places here on WebDM. Pa pa pa. pa pa pa. Oh. K pop has taken like high music and elevated it. It's so much better than American pop music. Free in Tokyo. Anyway, you get the gist. There are bitches. She's yeah, saying hi she's to saying them. She's saying hi to them.